Today's lesson is on origins. What's the origin of the world? What's the origin of life? And most importantly, what's my origin and yours? The answers to these questions affect the very outlook we have on life and can affect our eternal destiny. Stay tuned. The Churches of Christ of the North Texas area present The Truth in Love. How precious is the blood divine by inspiration here. Thanks for staying with us. I'm David Roper, your host for The Truth in Love. Our guest speaker today is Wayne Jackson from the East Main Street Church of Christ in Stockton, California. Mr. Jackson's specialty is the field of Christian evidences. There are no more Im important and crucial questions than the ones with which he'll deal today. Is there really a God? Did he really make the earth and did he really make us? Mr. Jackson will be speaking to us right after this next song. In the meantime, meantime, you may want to call a friend who's been unsettled in his or her mind concerning the questions I've mentioned. I'll be back at the end of the program with one of the finest free offers we've ever made. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the to be with you. You know, man is the only creature on earth who is interested in the question of origins. Well, as a matter of fact, he's the only creature who's capable of being interested in the question of origins. We're interested in what is the origin of the universe? 
And what is the origin of biological life? And what is our own origin? In a series of two broadcasts, we're going to be discussing these questions. We hope that you'll rivet your interest upon the material that we have to present. In the first lesson this morning, we're going to be talking about the origin of the universe. But preliminary to that, I want to stress that the universe in which we live is a vast, complicated machine. For example, we live in a small, stellar community that's known as the solar system with our sun and nine surrounding planets. Our solar system is a part of a larger community known as a galaxy, and we call it the Milky Way galaxy. Then there are multiplied thousands of galaxies that compose the universe as a whole. Let me, if I may, give you somewhat of an idea of the vastness of this universe in which we live. Imagine, if you will, that I had a chalkboard and I wanted to do a map of the universe. In the center of the chalkboard, I would place a dot. That would represent our sun. One inch away from that, I would put another dot, and this would represent our Earth. Now, we know that our Earth is 93 million miles away from the sun. Accordingly, the scale of our map is, therefore, one inch represents 93 million miles. Now, what would I have to do if I wanted to proceed to the side of my map and indicate our nearest star neighbor? How long would my chalkboard have to be? Can you believe that it would have to be four miles long just to get our nearest star neighbor on it? according to that scale of one inch to 93 million miles. But suppose I wanted to extend the map to the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Can you believe that our chalkboard would have to be 25,000 miles long just to reach to the center of this galaxy community in which we live? So we're talking about a splendid, marvelous, vast universe. And incidentally, it is a universe. It's not a multiverse, but it operates in such mathematical precision that we can predict uh, solar eclipses and lunar eclipses years in advance. The universe is truly a fantastic, gigantic machine. But the question we're considering today is this, where did it come from? Did you know there are only three possible explanations for the universe? And I offer the friendly challenge for you to try to think of some other, and you'll not be able to do it for there is no other. Now listen very carefully. These are the only three possible explanations for the existence of our universe. Number one, it has always existed. It didn't have an origin, but simply it always was. Number two, it created itself from nothing. Or number three, it was created by something or someone of a different nature from itself, something that existed before it did, and consequently upon which or upon whom it is absolutely dependent. Now, let's take these three possibilities and examine them very carefully. Number one, has the universe existed forever? Well, of course, this has been the assumption and the contention of atheism for many, many years. Unfortunately, however, for that particular philosophy, that theory no longer holds in the light of modern science. I have before me a book which I want to quote from. Let me first give you a little information regarding the book. The title of it is, Until the Sun Dies. 
and it's authored by Dr. Robert Jastrow. Robert Jastrow has been called the greatest science writer alive today. He teaches at Columbia University. He also teaches at Dartmouth College. He was the founder of Goddard Space Institute, and he has been affiliated with NASA, and he's one of the leading scientific authorities in the world today. Incidentally, Dr. Jastrow is not a believer. He classifies himself as an agnostic, which means that he contends that there is not a sufficient amount of evidence available for establishing the proposition that God is. I mention that to show you that he is not biased in the testimony which I'm about to read from him. Now, if you will, listen very carefully to this testimony. And remember, we're discussing the point as to whether or not the universe is eternal. I'm reading from page two of his book. What is the ultimate solution to the mystery of the origin of the universe? The answers provided by the astronomers are disconcerting and remarkable. Most remarkable of all is the fact that in science, as in the Bible, the world begins with an act of creation. Now that view has not always been held by scientists. Listen to this. Only as the result of the most recent discoveries can we say with a fair degree of confidence that our universe has not existed forever, that it began abruptly, without apparent cause, in a blinding event that defies scientific explanation. Let me read another paragraph a little bit later on from Dr. Jastrow's book. Listen to this, please. It is really very surprising that the labors of the astronomers studying the universe through their telescopes should have brought them to the conclusion that the world had a beginning. Scientists feel more comfortable with the idea of a universe that has existed forever because their thinking is permeated with the idea of cause and effect. They believe that every event takes place in the world and can be explained in a rational way as the consequence of some previous event. If there is a religion in science, this statement can be regarded as its main article of faith. But the latest astronomical results indicate that at some point in the past, the chain of cause and effect terminated abruptly. An important event occurred, the origin of the world for which there is no known cause or explanation. And he's speaking, of course, in the scientific sense. So, I've introduced the testimony of one of the world's leading scientists to the effect that the universe is not eternal. So away goes option number one. We mentioned a moment ago option number two, and it was this. The universe somehow or another created itself from nothing. Well, that really is not a very credible position. And I know of no person in the scholastic community who entertains it as a serious possibility. It's contrary to all of our experience, contrary to all science, as such is known. For example, no automobile ever created itself, no house ever constructed itself, no hammer or wrench ever fashioned itself, and the universe, this gigantic machine of which we spoke earlier, certainly has not created itself. As a matter of fact, one of the world's foremost physicists, Dr. George Davis, had an article some years ago that was published in the Reader's Digest, and Dr. Davis made this statement, which I quote verbatim. He said, no material thing can create itself. And that is basically a scientific law that's indisputable. So, our three options were, number one, is the universe eternal? We've demonstrated that it is not. Number two, could it possibly have created itself? Again, we've shown that that's not a viable possibility. 
Well, what was option number three? This. That the universe must have been created by something or someone that is anterior to it, that is, existed before it did. And something or someone that is of a different nature than the material composition of the universe. Now, let me make a suggestion that I think you'll easily see the truth of. All things that exist may be classified as either matter or mind. What is matter? Matter is simply defined as that which occupies space. You can't think of anything that cannot be classified as either matter or mind. Now, file that away for just a moment. We're going to come back to it. But let me introduce this premise for your reflection. If there had ever been a time in the history of our universe when absolutely nothing existed, then there would be nothing today. For it is an axiomatic principle that nothing can produce nothing but nothingness. If you ever had nothing, you would always have nothing. For nothing cannot produce something. Well, what's the implication of that statement? Well, simply this, that something has always existed. Since uh, something exists today, it necessarily follows that something has always existed. All right, now I'm about to make an argument. Follow me very carefully, please. Something has always existed, but that something that has always existed must either be matter or mind, for those are the only two possibilities. But we've already demonstrated that that which is eternal is not matter, because matter does not contain the intrinsic properties of eternality. One of the basic laws of science is called the second law of thermodynamics. And one of the implications of the second law of thermodynamics is simply this. Everything in the universe is wearing out, growing old, winding down. You're not younger than you were ten years ago. If you buy an automobile and drive it for five years, it's not five years newer than when you bought it. Everything is running down. Matter is wearing out. And so scientists say that one of the clear implications of the second law of thermodynamics is that matter itself, at some point in the past, must have had a beginning. So, since something is eternal, and that something must either be matter or mind, and we know, in fact, that it is not uh, matter, the only option is that it must be mind. There is an eternal mind that is responsible for the creation, for the origin of this wonderful universe in which we live. Now, the Bible identifies that mind as God. Genesis 1-1 begins in this fashion. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The great mind, therefore, of the universe is the mind of God. Now, the second question that uh, engages our interest is that of the origin of life. Evolutionists contend that a couple of billion years ago, life was spontaneously generated in some primeval slime pit of the ancient past that molecules somehow or another arrange themselves into a fortuitous condition, and so life upon the earth was spontaneously generated. We want to discuss the question of the origin of life uh, a little bit in this program, and then continue our presentation in greater detail in the following program. 
But let me first make several observations concerning the question of the origin of life. Again, to reduce the matter to the simplest possible form, there are only two possibilities concerning the origin of biological life. Biological life was either commenced uh, naturally or it had its beginning supernaturally. Let's consider the first possibility for a few moments. Most scientists contend for the theory of uh, spontaneous generation. Simply defined, spontaneous generation is that concept, which I briefly described a moment ago, that life in and of itself from inorganic, that is, non-living substances at some remote point in the past was able to generate itself suddenly without any outside help or guidance of any sort, without any plan, was able to generate itself into a living substance. And from that initial living substance, all forms of life, it is alleged, ultimately evolved. Well, so far as the actual facts of science are concerned, there is absolutely no basis for that. In fact, there is a well-established scientific law known as the law of biogenesis. And if you read your various biology books and zoology books, you'll find this law stated very clearly. The law of biogenesis states this, that all life comes from pre-existing life. As a matter of fact, there were a number of scientists back in the 1700s and 1800s that clearly established this. Men like Reddy and the more familiarly known Louis Pasteur. Pasteur demonstrated by a series of experiments that biological life cannot generate itself. He took certain substances, for example, and put them in test tubes and sealed them off from foreign influences such as uh, microbes in the atmosphere and demonstrated that when substances are sterilized, if they are protected from germs in the air, they remain sterile and they will never produce life. Consequently, science testifies to the fact that life cannot spontaneously generate itself. Well, if life could not spontaneously generate itself, where did it come from? Well, if I may say so in a courteous way, the common cop-out for those who subscribe to the evolutionary theory is this. They argue that we know, as a matter of scientific fact now, that life can't spontaneously generate itself. But we believe that at some remote point in the past when conditions were different, that's the way it happened. Did you notice that term that they employ in their vocabulary? We believe this is the way it happened. The concept of the naturalistic origin of life is just as much a matter of faith as an endorsement of the biblical account. Don't ever let anyone say, therefore, that I'm a scientist or I believe in science and the scientific explanation for the origin of life is naturalistic, the concept of spontaneous generation. That simply is not so. It is not a matter of science. It's a matter of faith. Well, if the evidence indicates that life could not have spontaneously generated itself, that is, come into existence in a natural way. The only other possibility is that it came into existence in a supernatural way and that there must therefore be an eternal source of life. And you know the Bible affirms that God is the author of life. Paul in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts in his great discourse in Athens, Greece, speaking to the philosophers of that day, said this, It is God that giveth to all life and breath and all things. God is the, honor, is the author of our existence, of our life, of our universe. And to Him we ought to give all credit and praise and honor 
and glory. David will mention in a moment a booklet that we're going to offer that contains much of the material and additional information on the theme that we're discussing in this series of two broadcasts. Rivet your attention, copy down the information that will be given, and tune in with us again next time. Oh, Mr. Jackson will be with us again next week to conclude this special presentation on origins. I hope you can be with us at that time. Now for that extra special offer I mentioned. Most of the material that Mr. Jackson is presenting, plus other value material, is in this 80-page book by Mr. Jackson entitled, Fortify Your Faith. Now this book has material on unbelief, the existence of God, Genesis, the theory of evolution, and the inspiration of the scriptures. It will be sent free and without obligation to all who request it as long as our supply lasts. So send us your name and address right away and ask for the book, Fortify Your Faith. And now before I close, let me tell you about another congregation that's supported this program, the Graham Street Church of Christ in Stephenville, Texas. This fine congregation meets at 312 North Graham Street, and their Sunday morning worship service is at 10.30 a.m. I know you'll always be welcome at any of their services. And I hope you can be back with us next week for the conclusion of Mr. Jackson's lesson. Until then, may God bless you abundantly. This has been The Truth in Love, sponsored by the Churches of Christ of the North Texas area. For a copy of today's program, additional information, or Bible correspondence course at no charge to you, please write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. Once again, write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. We invite you to attend the Church of Christ in your area. Join us again next Sunday at the same time for The Truth in Love.